<clears throat> this is for symmetry reasons. Now, what can happen is that we may have both polarization and uh, magnetization because your material contains both polar and magnetic ions. So, for example, iron or manganese, and polar ions typically are bismuth. That is, I think, uh, chemists know much better than physicists. So, the lone pair uh, ions uh, like uh, Bismuth or, or lead contains uh, S, uh, the 6S, uh, for example, bismuth contains the 6S2 lone pair, which polarizes the ion. And, uh, but the problem is that you have both polarization and magnetization, but usually the coupling is weak because the two orders are associated with the two distinct sublattices in the crystal structure. So here you have large polarization large magnetization, but weak coupling between the two. These are called properferroelectrics. You have the, co the opposite situation where, which I already mentioned, where the polarization is induced by magnetism. So the coupling is inherently large, but until now, the polarization has been always very weak. So this is a very important point. You can forget the, the rest. But if you want an interesting material, ferroelectric material, uh, you must have both, right? A large coupling, a large P. In the case of improper ferroelectrics, until now, the, the pitfall is a, a small, a weak polarization. In other words, the coupling is not able to induce a large P. And these are examples of manganites because I will, will show other manganites, but there are, of course, uh, materials with, uh, with iron and, uh, and uh, etc. So the challenge is how can we combine large polarization with large magnetoelectric couplings? And this is where uh, our materials uh, are interesting and, and uh, promising. Is, is this clear? I hope so. Now, um, how can we? tailor and control spin lattice coupling. There is one important effect. Uh, I don't know if some of you have heard about the Jan Teller effect. Who has heard about the Jan Teller effect? Very good. <laughs> now, just to know if I ever can go quickly or not, but I don't want to be boring this. But So uh, the Jan Teller effect is, a, is an effect which involves a spontaneous distortion of a lattice. For example, you take simple perovskites and you have octahedra um, of uh, octahedrally coordinated D ion, for example, transition metal ion, surrounded by oxygens. Now, in this uh, coordination, the five uh, levels, the, the five D levels split into two by symmetry, um, a triplet a T2G called, and, and a doublet EG, this is due to the crystal field. And uh, uh, if you have one electron, for example, the case of manganese 3 plus, in this EG doublet, then because of Hunt, Hunt um, rule, you have a high spin configuration, and then you have this spin configuration, and then, uh, uh, of course, this fourth electron must uh, jump from this level to this one, right? So you, you have an electronic energy. The, the electron here prefer to be here rather than here. So you have to pay this, this, this price. But you can pay a lower price if the octahedron is elongated, typically. And in this case, the, the, the doublet the degeneracy is lifted, and, and this level is now at lower level, and the other one, the x squared minus y squared, goes up, goes up. And then you gain, basically, this delta energy divided by 2, right? More or less. So you pay elastic energy, because this distortion pay, uh, costs some elastic energy. On the other hand, you gain an electronic energy. So 
typically in these systems, the electronic energy wins and there is a spontaneous distortion. So you already see there is a non-adiabatic uh, interaction between <coughs> the electron degree of freedom and the lattice degrees of freedom. So this problem cannot be treated as a perturbation. And uh, So the electron, uh, this uh, go, uh, goes here. But so, they are all so the three here remains here. Two plus one plus one. One, two, three, and fourth here. So in fact, uh, this uh, splitting is very small, and this is much larger, and, uh, and so that's why it's uh, the, the energy gain is of the order of fraction of electron volt. So it's, it's a large energy. So the lattice distortion is driven by the electronic energy. And that's very important for the, the for this following. Now I've just considered the charge degrees of freedom. What about the, uh, the spin degrees of freedom? Let's consider, so this spin lattice coupling, I just showed the charge lattice. So because of exchange interaction, uh, if you have two, for example, magnetic ions uh, bridged by a p orbital of oxygen because of uh, exchange interaction. You have that in the case of antiferromagnetic coupling between neighbors, you have the smallest mn mn separation, the distance between these two ions. In the case of ferromagnetic coupling, you have a large separation. In the case of paramagnetic interaction, you have the la even larger. So you see there is, a, again, a coupling between the magnetic structure and the magnetic interaction and uh, the, um, the lattice uh, distortion. So a different magnetic structure can induce uh, a distortion in the lattice. Okay, that means that uh, the manganese, is what? manganese is here with the spin down, manganese is here with spin up, okay. here in these two, and these represent two electrons of, of occupying uh, the, the oxygen two minus ions. So all the, the p orbitals are filled, right? And because of the exchange interaction, uh, you can, this is the so-called super exchange theory by Anderson, you, you may refer to this, also developed by uh, uh, Komsky, uh, Kugel, Komsky, etc. Develop, uh, uh, but the main paper is by Anderson, which shows these, uh, these effects of, uh, in the case of, um, of, uh, manga, uh, of transition metal ions. Okay, so, uh, this mechanism is very effective in doped manganese, like this perovskite structure, where you have a partial occupancy of the A side by a rare earth, this is why R, typically trivalent, and, and um, alkali metal, typically divalent, because this changes the valence of the manganese ion, so you can have either a Jan Teller ion if you have three plus, or a non Teller ions, you have four plus. So chemical doping can change the occupancy of the EG orbital and therefore can tailor the, the structural distortions. And since the orbitals can be empty or uh, filled, you can have either antiferromagnetic or ferromagnetic exchange. And you can have Another mechanism of magneto, um, uh, magneto striction, which is uh, the so-called spin orbit coupling, which induces the, okay, the, the inverse jaluzinski moria coupling, which implies that uh, a, a distortion of the uh, octahedra can uh, induce a non-collinear non magnetic interaction, but this term is usually smaller because the spin orbit coupling is, uh, as you know, a relativistic correction.
OK, so you can have a various, um, may, you may read almost here, charge and spin orderings, uh, various types of magnetic orderings, depending, for example, you have here antiferromagnetic A. You see you have ferromagnetic planes coupled antiferromagnetically. You have here a fully ferromagnetic structure. This is, again, antiferromagnetic, but you see it's a, uh, that the topology is different, etc. This is a cl common classification of, uh, of ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic uh, cubic structure, and you can have even a combination of the two. In the case of uh, perovskites, for example, in the case of lanthanum manganese O3, which is the counterpart of the system, which I will tell you in a moment. It turns out that you have a type magnetic structure. So you have ferromagnetic planes coupled antiferromagnetically. And this is, can be understood in terms of the two uh, issues which I just described, the young teller effect and the type of, of the sign of the magnetic exchange between neighboring sites depending on the orientation of the orbitals. So here, typically, you have a ferromagnetic coupling, and you have a typically zigzag pattern of orbitals. This is the dz squared minus r squared orbitals, the 3z squared minus r squared orbital, right, which has a shape of a double cigar, which is occupied when, when uh, you have a 3 plus manganese. So you have a Jan Teller distortion. And uh, in order there, to minimize the energy, the, the structural distortion is accommodated in this zigzag shape, which also implies, because of the super exchange theory I just mentioned, a ferromagnetic coupling within the AC plane. So we have basically uh, these planes and coupled antiferromagnetically along the B axis. So this is just to show how complex and interesting the interplay between charge, spin, and orbital ordering can occur in these materials. And of course, this is a pioneering work in the 50s, which has been fostered a great deal of research. So you have orbital order, you have spin order. Um, and of course, this is uh, uh, tailored by the geometry. For example, you may know that the magnetic exchange J depends on the hopping integral. So depending on the bonding angle between the two neighboring metal ions, you, so you change the strength of the magnetic exchange. So that's very important also. And, uh, and the point is the understanding this interplay is relevant to understand the magnetoelastic coupling and then multiferricity. OK, uh, this is the, 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 the idea why we are interested in new type of perovskites. In the simple perovskites, you have a, a complex structural distortion. So the title is Large Structural Distortions in, this, uh, in simple perovskite. Why this? Because uh, um, in, a, in a typical perovskite, the cubic ideal structure is never stabilized because you should have that this distance, AO, should be equal to square root of BO, right? This depends upon the, the size of the A and B ions. This, in fact, is never accomplished. And therefore, the elastic strain associated with the, the mismatch between the BO plane and the IO plane is accommodated to various types of distortions, the most common one being the so-called orthoferrite, which is an orthorhombic.